So good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our November Community Coffee Hour. We are very excited to be discussing um, infusing therapeutic approaches to mentoring using strategies from cognitive behavioral therapy. So this is, for some of you, you might be familiar with cognitive behavioral therapy. For some folks, that might be kind of a new, a new concept. So we're really excited to hear more from our guest speakers today. Um, we do have Jennifer Kreeble. Uh, she's the National Director of Reach and Rise, and we'll hear a little bit more about her background here in a second. And then we also have Manolia Tanyu, who's a senior researcher at the American Institute of Research. So we'll be hearing from both of them in just a second. So if you all who are with us this morning can introduce yourself in the chat box, that would be lovely. So we know kind of who is with us today. If you wanna give us your name, um, pronouns, what mentoring program or organization that you're with, and your role, and anything else that you think might be pertinent to today's conversation. We would love to know who's with us. For those who might not be familiar uh, with us just yet, we are Mentor Virginia. Uh, so our mission is to foster quality mentoring relationships that empower, elevate, and encourage young people. We do that through a variety of uh, different services. We provide training to <clears throat> mentors, mentees. Uh, we have an AmeriCorps VISTA program around the state. <laughs> we provide no cost consulting and we have a national quality um, assessment process that we are able to offer to programs so that they know how well their programs are aligning with national best practice standards. We have an amazing team uh, that helps us uh, work towards this mission and all of these services that we provide. So you will see some of these faces on the screen with us today. And we also have a new person, so new that we don't even have a picture of her yet. Uh, Pam Johnson has just joined us as our Youth Impact Coordinator, AmeriCorps VISTA, and we're very excited to welcome her to the team. And then we also have an incredible uh, extended team of consultants who do a lot of work, boots on the ground with mentoring programs in our state. Some of you might know some of these folks, and if you don't, um, all of them are providing no-cost consulting through our technical assistance program. So if you want to get to know them, there is an opportunity to do so. And lastly, kind of setting the stage for today's uh, topic, you know, what brought you to this meeting today? Are there any specific questions you have kind of about where mentoring and, and therapeutic approaches kind of meet and how that might look for your program. Um, any questions, please throughout the meeting, drop those into the chat and uh, we will make sure that we address those throughout the session. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and I'm gonna turn things over to our guest presenters for the day. Hello everyone, let me just figure out how to start my sharing. And let me know what you see. Do you see our first slide? Okay, great. Um, so I'll I'll start with introducing myself, and then I'll ask Jennifer to introduce herself. Um, I'm Manolia Tanyu. I'm a senior researcher at American Institutes for Research. I'm joining this conversation today from Virginia, Fairfax area. Um, I am a community psychologist and prevention researcher by training, um, and at AAR, as part of my work, I um, um, do a lot of research and evaluation on um, community and school-based initiatives, um, looking at how interventions support youth development, social emotional well-being, and resilience. Um, youth mentoring is dear to my heart. Um, I'm a mentor myself. Um, I have worked on a number of um, youth mentoring research and evaluation studies, and the one that we want to talk about today that I'm going to be talking about, um, the evaluation, um, is um, the reach and rise evaluation that we have, we are just wrapping up um, in collaboration with um, the reach and rise and American Institutes for Research. Um, I'm also a research board member for the National Mentoring Resource Center, if you are familiar with that resource. Um, and I do uh, training and technical assistance for um, uh, NMRC as part of my research board work. Um, so I, I mean, I really look forward to hearing more about your work and 
you know, your program. So let's stay in touch. And I'll just ask Jennifer to do the introduction too. Good morning, Virginia. <laughs> My name is Jennifer Kriebel. I'm the National Director of Reach and Rise, which is a program of the YMCA of San Francisco. I kind of noticed that, oops, I left out my Y employer. Um, let's see, I am based out of San Francisco, California. So I am on the West Coast. So good morning. If you know I'm a little still waking up, you guys start off your day a few hours earlier than we do. Um, excited to be here, excited to share about Reach and Rise. Um, any opportunity I can talk about therapeutic mentoring, I think is phenomenal and hugely important in our movement of mentoring. Um, we're a national program currently in uh, 10 states, soon to be 11. Um, we used to be in Martinsville, Virginia, once upon a time. So I am familiar with your state a little bit. Um, excited to be here with Manolia. We are, we've survived, I should say, a five-year research project, which was a little brutal randomized, we'll get into all the details, but it's exciting to show results. And I'm just waiting for AIR to finalize this report so I can go shout at the top of the mountain to share some of the good results that we have experienced. So i um, happy to be here. Let's make this informal, keep the discussion. Um, that'd be great. Yeah, I think we did the introductions, but this slide yeah. is basically telling you a little bit about what who Reach and Rise is, um, American Institutes for Research, and our partnership um, together to study um, and look whether pairing research informed cognitive behavioral treatment practices with mentoring programming will yield any benefits to youth. Um, but today's like my sharing um, on the study will be more around the implementation part. So the any findings or any outcomes are in our future conversations. So um, I will be focusing on the implementation part. Okay, so I guess we can just skip this very quickly. Um, so Jennifer will get us started and she will talk about what we mean by cognitive behavioral therapy, if you're not familiar with that concept, how it might apply to mentoring programs. Um, she will introduce Reach and Rise and the program components that support the infusion of a therapeutic approach to mentoring. Um, I will share a little bit about the evaluation and what we heard from the mentors and from the caregivers. And this is really an opportunity for us to um, share and learn from each other. So we look forward to the conversation at the end. Um, if you wanna take just a few minutes and share with us so we can know um, your work that you're doing, if you're familiar with um, cognitive behavioral therapy, maybe we can say CBT from now on um, and the strategies. Um, if you have any experience incorporating CBT strategies into mentoring relationships and what your program is doing or what brought you to this uh, coffee hour today, that will be great. So we can um, hear a little bit about you. Yeah, if you can go off mic, that would be great. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, the chat function is always, you know, trying to chew gum and walk at the same time. So if people want to share CBT, familiar, not familiar, something you use in your mentoring programs. Yeah, I'll speak. Um, so my husband's a therapist, and so I'm very familiar with CBT and that type of work. However, um, my program hasn't implemented it yet because we, we've been drawing the line between therapy and mentoring. <laughs> However, now I realize that a lot of kids need a therapeutic application. So I'm here just to learn how we can start. Let's muck that up. I'm gonna <laughs> mix it up. Love it, that's great. And I'm sure your husband uses CBT in your marriage too. So it's you know kind of quite universal. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? All the therapists out there, come on. I don't see anything in the chat box yet. Okay. So. Well, let's move on. Okay. 
All right, maybe this is an easier question. Um, do you consider your program therapeutic or what makes a program therapeutic? Again, I remember I, I've been to a few, I've been in this position now 11 years as the National Director of Mentoring for the Y. Um, and I remember going to the summit, I think it was like 2012. <laughs> And therapeutic was like, you know, not many people were talking about it. It wasn't on the top of the, you know, all the workshops. And I've seen a huge shift now in 11 years. So now therapeutic is the favorable buzzword and people are using it. I think there's an institution in Massachusetts that you can be certified as therapeutic. Um, so I'm super curious, you know, what your thoughts on this therapeutic terminology? What does that mean to you? Um, I, Come on, Virginia, it's 7.13 a.m. Come on. <laughs> I'm trying to be quiet and chill this morning. I'm a little tired. <laughs> but anyway, I think uh, the therapeutic shift probably really has to do with us trying to understand what is actually going on in the young person's life and not so much getting to the root cause as to why and how they got there. We, we spent a lot of time, we were always talking about the the saberism and that aspect of the work, but just meeting the young person where they are, so what, what's going on then I think that approach is one of the things that uh, should, should help us, particularly Mental Virginia as an organization to begin to shift and rethink how we build the capacity for our partners to understand how to include some of those best approaches and practices with that. Great, honest, appreciate it. Well, just to time in, can, can you hear me, guys? Perfectly. Good. Um, I'm not very familiar with the term, but I would think that therapeutic is kind of more on the level of not being clinical and kind of more holistic or alternative type approaches. Excellent. Anybody else? want to add to this word all right next slide please Manolia. so why would we consider therapeutic mentoring and someone mentioned this earlier um there's a need our kids need more intentional support and when I talk about therapeutic mentoring, to make it easy, and the way I train the directors for Reach and Rise, is that therapeutic is more intentional in our approach. Why do we want to be more intentional and not just a recreational-based activity? Is because our kids need it. The New York Times had just put out an article April of this year, and the mental health crisis of our young people is astounding. The number of cases of suicide, depression, anxiety is through the roof. We also had a pandemic, which of course just made things even worse. So we have so much mental health need that we cannot rely on our therapists to support our young people. The numbers don't add up. The number of kids needing a therapist Needing a therapist in school, what is the ratio? I mean, I might be exaggerating, but one in 3,000 kids, school counselor. So what's the likelihood that our kids are going to receive mental health care? It's, it's a challenge that we have to meet as a mentoring movement. Then the kids of color disproportionately aren't going to get mental health, have access to a therapist, or have a therapist that looks like them. That is also a challenge. Families trying to access mental health, the waiting lists are six months, a year, it's amazing. So the solution that I am coming to you today is that I'm asking you to expand your mentoring programs and really start to address the mental health needs of our kids. And it can make a huge difference. All right, next slide, please. So the CBT stuff. So one of the things that I wanna do today and, and Manolia will help too, 
is to kind of demystify the language we use. Some of this language is so therapeutic or for therapists only. And my challenge is like, let's, let's use common words to describe what CBT is. And let's train our mentors on this practice. I think CBT is extremely helpful and it's been proven, right? That it is the great therapy to address depression, anxiety, impulse control. CBT is where it's at. And it doesn't need to be a therapist that are exploring some of these basic strategies and interventions. It does not. I'm not a therapist, I'm an MSW, but I would challenge any therapist that say that we can't train our mentors on some of these basic skills. CBT. And you know, you, you could even go on YouTube. I mean, again, I'm not trying to take away from the power of this, but you can go on YouTube and watch a therapist do some basic practices of CBT with the child. It's very easy. The basic concept of CBT is this triangle. You can even draw a big triangle on the ground for your young people. The concept is what's in your head, what you're thinking, what your thoughts are, is going to cause feeling. And those feelings influence your behavior. It's this triangle. Super helpful. So what we try to do is to teach kids, teach mentors to teach kids on this relationship between these three things. What's going on in your head? Maybe what's an immediate thought, these automatic thoughts that pop in. Then I have this feeling and then I act out. So this cognitive triangle is what we teach our mentors. And I would like to pause, and I'm not sure if it's in a different slide, but training our mentors prior to being matched is part of our program. We provide 18 hours of training to our mentors at Reach and Rise before they're matched. Um, I think it's the best part of our program. If I'd pick one thing that I would you know, say that is a must do is training. Um, it's an opportunity for us to meet our mentors or volunteers, spend time with them, train them, give them some basic skills, get to, get to know who they are, um, make better matches, screen out people that aren't going to be appropriate, and see if they can show up for five weeks in a row for training. Because if they can't show up for five weeks for training, then they're not going to show up for a year commitment with our young people. So that was a quick little plug on training. So we do spend quality time with our mentors. We just don't give them a handbook and and, and introduce them to their child and off they go. Um, so this question on this triangle, any questions or thoughts? Simple. One of the things that, that is interesting to me about this is, can you talk a little bit about if a person is in fight or flight mode, how well CBT will work or if there's a, a trauma response taking place? Um, you know, those are some of the issues that I feel like people are most hesitant to enter into and, and touch. <laughs> yeah, the brain is going crazy, right? With that kind of an immediate, your brain is just on fire. I have one director who loves neuroscience and he can spend hours talking about what your brain is doing and how you get, you know, that. Certainly, we're going to go through some strategies. Um, and interventions, and some are going to be more appropriate at that moment of pure trigger trauma. Um, and it, great. Thanks, Manolia. Man, <laughs> it's kind of weird not having power to control, but it's like, yeah, let's go here. So, you know, really, um, let me just keep moving on my slides. Kind of trying to stop relaxation techniques, mindfulness breathing techniques. I think those are some of the basics that you would want to engage in if a child is having a pretty severe response at that moment. Um, it's not time to talk about core beliefs and where is this coming from. It's just time to like ground them to the present and do some mindfulness, relaxation, breathing techniques for sure on that. Um, you got to get the brain back in, you know, out of that mode and into more of a, you know, cognitive mode. Um, so these are some strategies. And again, even the words on the slide, and I want to re-emphasize, re you know, the language that we use to describe these things is really important. 
Um, and so we try really hard and Manolia will show you we need some more work and how we train our directors to train our mentors to better explain these things. Um, demystify, make them common understanding of CBT. So here are some strategies. Um, and again, depending on the age of the child too, right? So you're working with an eight-year-old or a 17-year-old, different approaches to this pattern or to these strategies. Um, identify thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. It's a pretty basic one, right? For a young person, you know, younger kids, how are you feeling today? You know, it seems like you're really angry today. You want to tell me a little bit more about that? Again, I'm not a therapist, but some basic, how are you feeling today is really basic. When you get a little older, a little bit more um, age on a young person, you can start talking about maybe some unhelpful thinking styles, which we'll get to in a moment. Those are great to talk about. Um, I have a quick question before you move on. Yeah. In the triangle, I noticed the arrows were going in the different directions and you just spoke about the identification aspect of it. Is there any starting point or would that individual as a mentor would just begin whatever the child is feeling at that point or having that discussion to engage in? I was just wondering if there's any uh, credence to that or not. Great question. Um, I know you wanna go back to the triangle? Sure. And I should probably should do a time check too. I'm really bad at that. Okay. Um, yeah, it could start at any point in time. Like when you want to do a stop and think moment, you could be intervening at the behavior because the kid's like, you want to stop? You know, what's going on for you? Why are you, you know, hitting your brother? Um, and so you would start there. What are you thinking? You know, what are you feeling? Well, I'm angry at my brother. Okay, you know, what, what does that make? You know, that's your emotion. What are you thinking about my brother? Well, my brother always, you know, takes things from me. Okay, you know, let's talk about what a different behavior that we can address that thought of your brother's always taking things. You know, what can we do differently? So you could in, intervene in any one of these things. Um, for sure, there's not a start starting place. Let's quickly go back to the strategies section. Um, nope, one more back, Manolia. Okay, uh, other good ones that I want to talk about is restructuring. Lots of restructuring happening, right? It's not a fancy term. What it really is, is that you're just reframing something, looking at some patterns of thinking and reshuffling it, if you will. Again, not clinical terms I'm using. So let's do a quick example. A kid says, you know, I am horrible at baseball. I stink. I hate it. I'm, I'm a loser. I can't do anything right. I can't make a basket, right? They're out of, they're spinning out of control with how horrible they are at basketball. So one of the things you're going to work with them as a mentor to their child is to kind of reframe that and to role model that. So maybe, okay, you're not so good at base basketball, but you know what? You're really good at creating um, art and painting or sculpting or, some, or something else that you are and focusing on, you know, you're really good at this. You may not be great at basketball, but you're really good at that. Just kind of that pattern of thinking that I'm a loser. I can't do anything right. Um, Process irrational thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Again, that's more of that relaxation technique. Um, we talk about mood mapping. You know, not a huge hit, not an exercise that has gone great, but just again, that relaxation, that mindfulness of being in the present um, is really helpful. Um, breaking those patterns, that automatic thinking kind of goes back to that core beliefs of working with the kid of where is this coming from? And understanding where are they getting these patterns is really helpful. And you can have that simple conversation. Celebrating success, that's the easiest one. Again, part of our strength-based approach as people, we want to really celebrate the baby steps, the, the, the successes, what they're doing well, when they change up a thought, when they identify a feeling, all these things merit a moment of, hey, well done, of really re restructuring that or finding something else that you're really good at or um, that you didn't hit your brother today. Um, goal setting is huge for us and monitoring those goals is, is a part of this too. So, okay, I know I'm trying to move faster. So a well-trained mentor are going to do these things, right? They're going to obviously be a very good listener, but they're gonna reinforce Problem solving skills, coping, which is really important when you're dealing with a child with high anxiety, right? 
reinforce positive behaviors. This, I don't like the wording on the slide, spot maladaptive thought processes. What does that mean? Just when something isn't constructive, then you help them change that up and reframe it. Um, again, constructive activities to learn the link between your thoughts, your feelings, behavior, that safe, supportive, interactive space is critical. Next slide quickly. So this is a really popular one. Um, again, unhelpful thinking styles, that's part of our, um, in our strategy of identify thought, feelings, and behaviors. It's really a great conversation, and this is something you could do with your partner or your spouse. <laughs> Looking at which ones of these are popular in your head, all or nothing, like it's all bad, I can't do anything right, that's a popular one for young people. Overgeneralizing, you know, this applies to everything. Um, let's see, <sighs> disqualifying the positive, uh, you know, wasn't there some saying that you got to do seven positives to one negative, or you downplay your positives, I think we all do that um, every day, so really focusing on what is going well, jumping to conclusions, this must mean that I'm just going to be bad at relationships for the rest of my life, um, catastrophizing or minimizing, um, another critical one, uh, shooting. Oh, I hate that word. I think that word should be eliminated from the English language, but my husband does it all the time. You know, we should have done this versus, hey, next time I'm going to try this approach, labeling personalization. So what are one of these that may resonate with you? We all kind of, I focus in on one in particular for shooting. What's something that is your go-to thinking style? These are unhelpful. Uh, you also see language like faulty thinking styles, which is not a great word. So we're going to do unhelpful thinking styles. Again, language is important here. Oh, you did not have a therapist say should. <laughs> oh, yowza. Sorry about that to me. Any all or nothing thinking thinkers out there? How is that helpful? Qualifying the, the, the positive. Mm. I'm good at something, but like that but word gets in there. Yeah, jumping to conclusions. I think the whole country did that yesterday pre-election. Don't you think so? Who was that? <laughs> Catastrophizer. Oh, wow. Personalization. Ah. <sighs> celebrating accomplishments. Awesome. And I know, you know, there's a lot of material here. You know, it's a kind of a 15 hours of training in 40 minutes uh, that, you know, is a, is a tough thing to do. Um, but I think it's worth the conversation. So if I would leave you today with anything, making sure this is my last slide, right? I'm going to take the next slide, Jennifer, and we can come back to this maybe after we're done with our conversation. Yeah. I think this is fine. We don't need to go through this. Okay. Skip to the next one? Yes, please. All you. Okay. Well, then it's perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to speed things up. I'm like, oh, no. Yeah, well, this is amazing conversation because already I hear from the comments and questions that you know, you're thinking now beyond what CBT is into and thinking about how I can do this with the mentors or because um, so. um, the, the goal is really to break down the core principles of CBT and help the mentors understand not only how to do this, but also infuse them into their interactions with their with the youth, right? With their mentees. And that's really what Reach and Rise is about. Um, providing training, ongoing conversation with the mentors um, that the site directors or the, the staff is doing, um, sharing materials um, to help the mentors think about, okay, here's an opportunity and let me just talk about, you know, irrational thoughts and using different strategies in 
The research study in the evaluation we engaged with REACH and RISE, um, we had two um, big questions. One was, if this happens, I mean, first of all, is like how do the mentors and caregivers use the CBT strategies and how is this CBT, infusion of CBT implemented across different sites? And then the other question was, what are the outcomes? How do we like, what kind of changes do we see in youth behavior based on what they're reporting back to us? In the next few slides, I will be primarily talking about what we heard from the mentors. So the focus will not be on our outcomes of the study, but really what we heard from the mentors, which of the strategies that Jennifer shared, they reported back to us that is easier for them, um, how they learned um, through the program support um, about these um, approaches. So that's the focus. And in our study, we said, let's just take um, the business as usual, as we call it, um, what the program is doing, and add on some more components to the Reach and Rise program to really make sure the mentors are understanding what CBT is. So take a more targeted approach. And by that, Reach and Rise um, added an additional module uh, that primarily talked about what CBT is, what these strategies are, in addition to the training they were offering. So instead of 15 um, hours of training, this just um, became one more module. So I think, Jennifer, I heard you say 18 hours. Um, yes. In addition, um, the program restructured the youth growth plan, which is a plan that they, the mentor and the mentee and the caregiver put together with the staff talking about like, these are the goals that we are going to focus on. So that youth growth plan was a little bit more structured to incorporate the CBT language. Um, the monthly checking calls with the mentors that the staff did um, was guide restructured a little bit. So the, the site director or the core, the, the, the program staff was, um, was guided to ask more about how are you including CBT in your interaction with the mentee? What are you doing? And talk more about the strategies more, you know, in a more targeted way. And a big component that we wanted to see how it works was engaging the parents in this conversation, right? Typically it's the mentor and the mentee and the program staff, but a big part of Reach and Rise is parent, the support provided to parents. So it's more like they're taking a case management approach. And with this, they um, created Reach and Rise, created a manual that they shared with the parent. And the goal was that, in every conversation the program staff has with the caregiver, with the parent, they were going to ask about these strategies and also help the parent understand what the, the therapeutic approach looks like. So in our study, we just looked at what we heard from the mentors and the caregivers um, about their experiences with these restructured approaches um, that Reach and Rice um, took. And I'm gonna be talking about that. Um, so we, as part of our data collection, we um, had follow-up surveys uh, for mentors where we asked a number of questions to understand how they work with the program, what they did, how they incorporated. Um, one of the questions was about, um, understanding what the agency did to help the mentors use the CBM strategies with their mentee. And as you see here on the screen, um, we heard from the mentors that the primary place where they learned about the CBT strategies was the training, because that's really preparing the mentor to understand how do I do this, what CBT is. So the majority of the mentors reported back to us that the training, the initial training really focused on that. Um, about half of them said um, the agency provided written materials and resources. Um, less than half said um, the program staff provided me with ideas during our discussion. As you know, um, a part of the mentoring program in addition to the uh, training is also the ongoing conversations that the program staff has with the mentors, right? So they really get some guidance and support from program staff as they work with the youth. Um, the logs that they were asked to complete, 
some of them, I mean, it's just one fifth of the mentors um, that say the logs help them. Um, and they had little, if just a few of them talked about the uh, connections they had with other mentors. So this slide shows the variation across the mentors and how they experience the program support. Um, but it also gives us the message that the training is really core to help the mentors understand. But then um, the conversations the program staff has with the mentors is also very important. But it's also fascinating when you look at this, like where's the other 40% on the training? They had to go through training to become a mentor. So it always blows me away that like, did they not get this training? Is it a model fidelity? Is a director not training on this? Um, just interesting conversations that this study has, you know, pulled back the curtain has revealed. I'm like, what happened to the other 40%? I'm going to go find them. <laughs> or is it that they don't remember, right? <laughs> or they don't remember, which is another issue. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so in our surveys, think about um, the slide that Jennifer shared, how um, we're kind of breaking down what CBT is and um, teaching the mentors um, different strategies to use with the youth. In our surveys, we had a list of questions we asked the mentors to tell us, so to help us understand how they are thinking about CBT and how they're using, to what extent they're talking with the program staff about these strategies. So these are um, the list of questions we ask the mentors. Um, we ask them about mindfulness. We ask them about um, getting the mentee to stop and think about the behavior, refuting lies, which is really questioning the self-talk that a person has inside, creating new habits. Some of these strategies that Jennifer mentioned, right? Relaxation, restructuring to manage anger, mood mapping, whole health checkup, journaling. These are all strategies that the mentors are learning during those 18 hours. And they were really guided to think about these strategies and terminologies during that additional module um, that was part of the study. Uh, so one question we had was, um, how often did mentors ask or talk with the program staff about these. So during the 12 months that they are matched with a youth, how often do they talk about these to get some guidance or to talk through or to learn or reinforce these strategies they could be applying? And um, this slide, I know it's very crowded, but it's basically telling us that mm -hmm. some of these strategies were used more easily with um, their interactions with the youth than the other ones. One question that we had been thinking is, is it the way we asked in our survey that was confusing to the mentors? Or is it just like, really some of these strategies are harder to apply in a mentoring relationship, for example, journaling or mood mapping. And that's why the mentors are reporting that they did not use it very frequently, right? But the other ones, like getting the mentee to stop and think about own behavior, um, celebrating success, creating new habits, mindfulness, these were really the most frequently uh, uh, talked about strategies with the program staff. So this question, this slide is really telling us what the mentor said that they were talking with the program staff. And it's interesting to see this variation because um, take journaling, for example, which is the bottom, the bottom second row. Only Not mood mapping. That was a bomb. <laughs> yeah, and only sixty-eight mentors out of more than hundred um, said that they are doing this, and they were doing this infrequently. But that also means some of the relationships. So, say um, when we talk to the mentors, more um, female mentors said that they they're female mentees were more likely to do journaling than a boy who likes to do more basketball, like play basketball, right? So some of these strategies do not lend itself to every type of mentoring relationship, 
But it's also a question, which of these strategies are easier to apply in a mentoring relationship? So keep this in mind as you're looking through the slide and think about which of these strategies you might be starting to, to apply in your mentoring program. Um, so this slide, we just pulled some quotes that we got from the mentors that shows um, from the from the site program staff, sorry, that shows how they heard the mentors um, talk about these strategies. Um, many times mentors did not realize they did the things we asked them to do, said one of the site directors. That's because some of these terminologies might be still too clinical, even though Jennifer said the goal in a mentoring program is to um, kind of like use a public term instead of a clinical term, but help the mentors understand how they can use these strategies in the mentoring relationship. But still the way I think the training or the manuals were structured still felt very clinical. So in their conversations, a lot of site directors told us that they had to change the way they're talking about these strategies. So maybe that's also what we are seeing in these surveys. Um, the second quote here says, the language is clinical, we make it more relational. When the mentors start to think heavily on terminology of CBM, I try to help them to think more intuitively and relax the language so they don't get stuck on the terminology. Um, so this is like a core lesson, I think, that's coming out of this study as we're hearing how the site directors are helping the mentors think about these strategies. Okay, so we also asked the mentors um, how they use these strategy, strategies in their interactions. And again, just like the other slide, we saw that a lot of the mentors were using celebrating success because that's a good thing, right? In these relationships, you really want to reinforce the good behaviors that the mentors are seeing in their interactions on a weekly basis they have with the kids. Creating new habits. Um, Jennifer just gave an example. If you're not good at math, let's try this. And that might be a strategy that the mentors might be using and reporting us out there. Um, stop and think about the behavior. Um, mindfulness. So these were the most commonly used strategies that the mentors shared with us that was working in their relationship. Look at the bottom of the slide. Um, journaling, mood mapping, again, these are very specific strategies, right? And maybe it's the way we ask them in the service, but it's also an indication for us, you know, maybe mood mapping needs to be either talked about in a different way with the mentors or mood mapping. So just checking about your mood. How do you feel today? Maybe it's not the best strategy in a mentoring relationship, or, you know, maybe that strategy needs to be talked about in a different way. So these were some of the things. And by the way, if you're looking at the numbers, so in our um, surveys, we asked them to rate the extent to which they're using this. So this was on a scale from one to four. Um, one is never, two is rarely, three is sometimes, and four is very often. Um, so if you look, um, 3.46, which is the top row, celebrating success, a lot of the mentors told us that they were very often using this strategy. Go down to mood mapping at the bottom, which is 2.55, which means they were rarely, and it's only 33 mentors said that they were using it. And if when they were using it, they were only using it rarely. So some of these strategies, this research tells us, lend themselves easier to be applied to mentoring relationships. And I would just add to this, too, that they're doing other things. I mean, this isn't a 50-minute clinical hour of a mentor and a mentee, right? We are still having fun and reaching rise. They're still right. eating and going and doing activities and bowling and all those other fun things. Um, so it's kind of an interesting perspective, too. It's like sometimes you do this because sometimes you're just eating at IHOP. <laughs> That's right. And it doesn't always come up um, the conversations, right? If you're, say, in an activity. But the goal is to really help the mentor think about how they can be more cognizant of these strategies and use these okay. um, opportunities during a conversation with the youth to really help them think about how they're feeling, how they're interacting with others, 
and how they perceive themselves. So that's really the therapeutic approach to mentoring that we're trying to unpack with the study. How do you really help the youth think about the behavior, um, the feeling, um, and how um, they understand themselves? So these are just a couple of quotes from the mentors um, that I think really showed how they're using this. Um, that they shared with us in focus groups. I'll just tell, talk about just one. Um, I did a lot of whole health checkups because she's a super busy high schooler. I will just check in with her to ensure that she's not neglecting herself. So it's like, how are you feeling today? Tell me about um, your emotions. Um, so here the mentors shared different strategies that they were doing. One thing that um, Jennifer mentioned um, is the last quote. We work through failures, such as my mentee not getting the spot he wanted on a basketball team. So this mentor was telling us how um, the, the men, he helped the mentee think about process this event that happened that was frustrating to the child and they talked through this. So it was the putting core beliefs on trial strategy that this mentor said that they're applying. They're not necessarily using the terminology but the goal is to really understand how they are doing this or how they are infusing the CBT strategies in their interactions. I'm gonna skip this one um, and let's move on to what we also heard from the caregivers and how they um, use these strategies. Um, as I mentioned, one big part of this study was to really see, can we also pull in the caregivers in the conversation of CBT strategies or a therapeutic approach? Can the mentor or the program staff help the caregivers also think about how they are interacting with the youth so they can kind of get informed about the CBT strategies, right? And the parents were handed an a, a manual with worksheets that they could use at home with their kid. Um, and um, the program staff, when they had uh, touch with the caregivers, they also asked them like, are, are you using it? Are you using the worksheet? Um, we saw here as this chart shows a lot of variation. Um, not every mentor or every program staff had these conversations with the, with the caregivers. So that's one. Um, finding we have about this. Um, it's also, as you all know, if you're in touch with the caregivers, it's hard to get hold of the parents, right? You don't always um, have um, a long time to really check in with the parent and say, how are you feeling? A lot of times these conversations are about the relationship itself. So engaging the caregiver in this conversation around these strategies um, did not happen as frequently as we were thinking was going to happen. Um, we also asked the caregivers um, if they used the workbook that was developed specifically for the study, the workbook where they were introduced to therapeutic mentoring, some of these um, CBT strategies they could be using with their kids. Um, and we learned that the workbook that is handed to the caregivers um, I mean, they kind of like put it on the site and did not use it very frequently. But one thing that we are also learning is how we talked about these CBT strategies. So just handing a workbook to the caregiver and saying, okay, use these strategies is not the most efficient strategy. You really need to figure out a time where we can, where you can talk with the caregiver about these strategies and about how they might be using it or how the mentor might be talking about these strategies with the caregiver. Um, in our focus groups, I had some really interesting conversations with the mentors or with the caregivers, how they helped the parent also think about um, how they're feeling about these interactions. You know, when you have a teenage girl, how can you break down CBT and help the caregiver um, figure out to improve the relationship you have with a teenage daughter, which is the situation that I'm in. And I'm learning a lot from the study, actually. So um, the, the caregivers gave us the idea that if you want to engage the caregivers in this conversation and in, inform them about um, applying these strategies, 
you have to have more conversations with them. It needs to be as part of the interactions. Just handing them a workbook is not the best strategy um, to do this. And to be clear, that is not the way we train directors to hand them a workbook. <laughs> this is where reality sets in of like, you know, we all know, my goodness, that's not the way it works. So a lot of interesting findings and insights we got from the study. Um, as we are wrapping up, we also will be sharing more about this at the mentor summit um, and through other venues. Hopefully um, we can come back and talk about this again. But let's just take the next 10 minutes or eight minutes that I have here um, and just get your reactions and what you think or if you have any questions for Jennifer or I. I have a question. So um, I, I've, well, I'll just say um, we want to start working with foster children and um, a gentleman in Richmond was giving us advice and he said, you really need to implement some therapeutic practices in order to really serve that population. So then uh, this was right on time to um, learn more about CBT. So I appreciate you guys, uh, you ladies for presenting today. Um, my question is, where do we get materials to teach or like how can we put together, uh, a, a, what did you say, 15 hours? <laughs> of material, where do we find those resources to get people trained? Well, as part of our um, grant through OJJDP that allowed us to do this study, I want to share all my CBT materials with you. Um, and I need to do a better job of distributing that. So working with Mentor um, and your various states partnerships, all of this material I will hand over. Um, so <laughs> we'll just quick talk. You know, I'm such a one-to-one -one relationship person, but I know there's some great resources that I just need to funnel that in. And we were also waiting for the research to be finalized, um, but it is, the time is now. So yeah. I would love to share this resources. And as Manolia said, in January, we'll do the big reveal. So the question is still outstanding. Did this work? Did CBT work? And you have to come to our workshop to find out the answer to that. <laughs> Um, I also, I know um, Sarah wants to take a few minutes and we have Leslie who raised her hand, but I also want to share um, two resources. Did I say your name right? Um, so one is um, the National Mentoring Resource Center and just type that up and search online. I can also, if you reach out back to us or maybe Sarah can also share, um, they provide a lot of resources. Um, if <laughs> If it's not specific on um, cognitive behavioral or CBT, I think Jennifer is the really the best resource. Um, I think Chronicle, um, what is it? Chronicle Evidence. The Chronicle um, of Evidence-Based Mentoring. Yes, that's another resource where I have seen more written um, mental health and um, CBT strategies. But as Jennifer said, the time is now. And um, this is still a new way of thinking about infusing this into mentoring. Um, so there will be more, I think, coming up in the future. Um, but just stay connected with us so we can share more or we can also, you know, like brainstorm on how to do this as part of a mentoring program. So this is really the opportunity for us to, you know, stay connected and create a, a community so we can learn from each other. Sorry, yeah, um, yeah, thank you. I um, just had a question about mentors in your program, uh, Jennifer. I guess I'm assuming that they knew before they signed up for the program that CBT was going to be a part of their training and expectation. No? Nope. Okay. What was clearly explained from moment one is that we do provide intensive training prior to match. Okay, okay. That so, we were, and we defined therapeutic too, but we didn't yeah. talk specifically. Do you have any, based on the experience that you, you've had, do you have any recommendations of you know, how to introduce CBT to mentors who are already in a mentoring program? Is the best way just to you know, uh, offer a, a training module or is there, you know, 
my, my sense is that some mentors would be um, intimidated by the therapeutic aspect of it. Um, and how, how do you, do you have any recommendations about how to get beyond that? I think what I take away from this, it's not, it's the way your directors are going to train on the material. Okay. And certainly Manolia pointed out, you know, she didn't show all the bad parts because there's good and bad things to learn. Like the directors who didn't have that background and weren't comfortable themselves with CBT, ah, we shouldn't have hired them. They weren't the right fit because they weren't able to share with the mentors. The mm -hmm. more seasoned, the more experience my directors have with the material, then they make mentors feel at ease. It's, you can pick just little pieces of CBT and mm -hmm. really incorporate those small everyday language reinforcement, right? So it's just a matter of the way your directors are training the mentors. But I think you could do some great workshops with your existing mentors. If you do monthly support groups or whatever you do, let's bring a topic. Let's talk about this, and how you can do that. And then we do, you know, constant check-ins with our mentors. So it's a, it's a follow-up thing, right? Like, how did that go last week? Did it work? What did you say? Mm -hmm. Or I struggled with this and I didn't know how to, you know, stop and think and reframe. And so it's a constant thing, but I think it's well worth it. I, I have another question. So when you are implementing training, because it is five weeks, yes, do, you, I, do you find like a, a certain day of the week, a certain time of day works best <laughs> people plug in so they don't fall off? Uh, you know what? We have probably, if I last counted, 80 six, maybe even 90% of our mentors stay in training. They don't drop out. Mentors love it. They love it. I get positive feedback. They feel prepared. They're ready to go. They're motivated. They're not anxious. Um, so our mentors that start training typically end training. And if they don't end training, that's probably a good reason, or they've been asked not to come back right? Because it's a great screening tool. So I think it's phenomenal. I have never had any regrets of doing the extended training. Uh, any particular night? No, it's going to, it's one of those doodle pull things. Um, oftentimes it's an evening thing, um, you know, five to eight, six to nine is usually what we do. Now that Zoom is part of our lives, you know, we can incorporate maybe not all in person, although in person is so much better. Um, but Sometimes if you do a little Zoom call, that breaks it up a little bit. Anyways, so much to talk about. And I know time is. <laughs> yes. So and maybe, I don't know if Manolia and Jennifer, if either of you could stay on for a couple minutes, just in case sure. there are any, any lingering questions and folks want to stay on for a couple minutes. But in order to respect everybody's time who maybe can't stay a little bit later, uh, we do just want to thank um, everybody who attended today. We want to thank our two amazing guest presenters for this great um, and really thought-provoking information provided today. Um, I think this will be a conversation that continues. And they both gave a great plug for the National Mentoring Summit. If you have not <laughs> registered for that, that's coming up in January. It's going to be in person in DC after a couple of years of, you know, we couldn't meet in person. So it's going to be a really great reunion for the whole mentoring community. And the results of the CBT study will be revealed in one of the workshops. So um We'll give more follow-up information in the, the follow-up email that I will send out where you can register and learn more about that summit that's coming up and any other um, up, upcoming opportunities that we have going on. So thank you, everybody who joined us this morning. And if anybody wants to stay on and kind of continue this conversation for a few minutes, we will keep the meeting open. I will need to hop off to another meeting. So I'm going to disconnect. But yeah, absolutely. If you're able to stay on. But um if you are, Sarah, willing to share my email, you know, I would love yeah. to stay in touch with anyone who has questions and share more or learn more about your need. Um, so thank you. Thanks for being here. And let's just continue the conversation, right? Absolutely. Thank you okay. so much, Manolia. Thanks, Manolia. Bye. Nice to see you. So much material to cover in such short time. I always struggle with like, what's most important to cover. And I mean, there's so much, so it's always the challenge. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you, Sarah, for the topic and the, uh, for the training today. Um, I may have missed it, but will Virginia, I mean, Mentor Virginia offer the CBT 
training or modules and the new mentor trainings or that's a how great, are you guys planning yeah. to embrace it well i think this is new to us too I mean, we're, we're oh. learning so and to me so i saw you come off mute as well so you can definitely jump yes in. um so what we're doing right now is we're going back through all of our trainings and sort of revamping them with a lens on you know critical mentoring cbt and all of that so in the coming year most of the trainings that have been done by mentor virginia will have kind of been refurbished a kind of a 2.0 um that will include some of these more evidence-based findings that we're that we've got so hopefully Great. that answers the question yeah it does and if someone wants the certification is it somewhere local like in the richmond area or do you recommend that you said one in massachusetts jennifer so i hear you know i think that's a <laughs> gatekeeping tool and do you need to be a certified you know, that's where I can get a little opinionated. <laughs> oh. I think I think these are so many things that are accessible today, that it can be incorporated today, that you don't need to be a licensed clinician. You don't need to go to certification. You know, you just need some basic understanding. Mm. Okay, that's my you. opinion. You're not going to do damage. Um, your trauma-informed care comment earlier to me is really important too. I mean, that's a section that we've are exploring how to better serve our kids. Oh gosh, that's another big one. You're on mute. Have you guys gotten any initial findings or anything related to trauma-informed, or, or are you still kind of working that? Still trying to build more of that into our curriculum. So we also need a version. I think we're at four point oh, but um, yeah. Keeping up with trauma informed care and how to deal with that. Right. Okay. I'll look forward to, to seeing what you guys come up with. <laughs> awesome. Any other questions before we before we hop off and let Jennifer maybe take maybe take a, a minute break uh, since she got up so early <laughs> to join us this morning. Thank <laughs> you. I still got another hour. <laughs> they're not up yet so sarah and tamise i'd be happy to send you our cognitive behavioral module and i just email you that and just cut through awesome. stuff and have at it that would be great perfect awesome and, uh, we'll see you i'll see you in january i signed up for the workshop so <laughs> all right it's good stuff appreciate you all Thanks yeah, for being thank there, Virginia. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you. We'll see, see you, you all next thank month. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.